my father's house was at 1716 Brewston, and two blocks down the street was King Records. Mr. Nathan let me come in, and I think that's where I learned to write, because I was watching him write, and I knew how to shut up, you know. <laughs> you know, that's the hardest part when you're a kid. Otis Williams and the Charms, they're from Cincinnati, too. We went to school together. And they never could sing with our guys. Oh, man, we, we blew everybody there away. We, we, would, we should have been somebody, man. You know? Did you say recording with that group? Yeah, yeah. Prior to going into the Air Force, in 55, Johnny Pate, you ever heard of Johnny Pate? Yeah. Well, he produced us. They recorded in Cincinnati. Yeah. I was uh, 17 in 56, so I was in the Air Force from 56 through 59. And I had, before I left, I had met Sam Cook, and then while I was in the Air Force, You Send Me came out, and he became instant legend, so you know I was chomping at the bit, you know, <laughs> raring to get out and get into this business, and, and I thought that my group would be equally prepared to do so because we were great. But when I got back, they had families, you know, guys had jobs at General Electric, you know, so, you know, some of the best jobs around, you know. That's when I started basically being a, a vocalist, you know. You know, I knew all the tunes. So I started doing gigs, jazz, you know, mostly jazz gigs because that's that's what was being played. That, you know, that's what they paid for. Now, I did a few things, worked the whole swing bar there. Seven days a week, seven dollars a night. But I had been singing prior to that. I had a group called the Echoes, and we had been on the road with Roy Hamilton and Illinois Jack Cat. Did a did a review with Man Tan Moreland. I was hooked, man. Oh man, I uh, met Mickey Stevenson and uh, and Clarence Paul. They were in my hometown doing the Regal Theater. They were from Motown at that time, and uh, they came to Cincinnati, and, and my group was on the show, and so they gave me that car. I said, man, you guys got to come up, you know. And then we also, uh, Smoking Them came down, and my group was on the show with, with Smoking Them, and that's when I knew that I had to come to Detroit, because we smoked Smoking Them. Man, oh, we smoked them. Oh, man, we smoked them. Yeah. My guys wouldn't leave. They wouldn't leave, so. And finally, I, I had a record. My first record uh, was a record called Come To Me Girl. This was my first single record. It was on, a, on the Pamela label. Obviously, you get it? They were trying. You know. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, because the guys that I had in Cincinnati that were managing me, you know, trying to emulate Motown. And on the other side was a tune called Stranger than a fairy tale. And uh, I wrote, wrote both of those. Huh? in the gig around Ohio and Kentucky and Tennessee. Those were good days. And I, I did another little tour. Well, now, yeah. I do you really want some chill? Yeah. Then baby, step right over here. Yeah. I'm gonna show you how to walk that camel walk. Oh, baby, baby, I can show you the camel walk. And I came here to do a gig with a guy, and I came in and did the gig, 
and the guy ran out with the money. So I find myself lodged firmly in Detroit. My father had told me, look, man, you run off on the road. I said, man, I did that stuff before you was born. Don't call me. Don't call me, man, you know. So I looked up and I was here in Detroit with $8.54. But you know. Did you try and get in with Motown when you came up to Detroit? Yeah, I, I was greeted poorly by that lady that was their secretary over there that was on the door there. I gave her the card. I'm going to say Mickey uh, Stevenson gave me this card and told me to come here. And then uh, if I should come, would you contact him? And she was real nasty with me. So I walked out. And I, I been, went back a few times to do backgrounds and other stuff, you know. I'd come and do a tenor part, you know. But I met a friend. A guy said, well, come on, man, take me over. And he took me over to the, on the east side. And so uh, he got me a job the next day. It turns out his family, some members of his family had a painting contractors, and I could paint. So I got a job painting, and, and then eventually I got enough money to get some clothes and, and uh, go to Phelps about two or three months later. And uh, I went into Phelps, Bobby Bland, oh, and the girls, uh, Patty and her group, you Patty know, LaBelle man. and the Bluebells, and Al TNT Braggs was on the show. So as I walked past, I, a guy waved him and I turned around to see who it was. It was Jockey Jack Gibson. He uh, was a DJ here and he was a DJ in Cincinnati. So Jockey Jack said, hey man, come here. He did, introduced me to the people around, one of which was Mike Hanks. See, this guy can sing. I, I say, man, he said, this guy can sing. Say, uh, put put him on there. And so I got up and did a tune, Ray Charles tune, I think, Drowning My Own Tears. And Mike came up to me. He was a good guy, man. He was a good teacher, had a good company. town I was head of A&R right so I signed all the artists and Rudy was the musical director see I couldn't play and so I had to whistle and hum and do everything to get Rudy you know to do it like I wanted until I could sing my stuff with him and in the early days in the pig pen job at the Webwood too. I, I was a stock man. I handled all the, all the liquor and took the inventory and, and made sure all the machines were emptied. Those were great days, the Webwood days. There were some great old clubs that we worked here, you know. The Webwood was one. The 20 Grand's gone. The, the Parrot is gone. The club I cracked my head on the Lee Sensation, gone. They had nice clubs on 12. Calumet. Met, that's where uh, Watch Boy Willie did his thing up in there. I, I, I comfortably niched the living as long as those clubs were alive. And that's when Pete and Martha and everybody was silent partners and Roosevelt Greer come to the label and we would thought we were gonna be big, and then they started not playing us. And somebody had told them not to play our stuff, or paid them not to play it. You know how that was in that day. Mike sincerely believed he knew he was being stepped on because he tried to buy a building next door 
to Motown. Well, see, him and Barry didn't get along at all. Because Mike always said, I was driving a Cadillac when he was riding a bike. And so, you know, he shouldn't have been messing with Barry. He bought that building up there. And somehow, Barry predated the contract that he had on the building because it was too close to Motown. And he took a board. But he, you know what he did? He put some dog do on the board. Then he walked around out in front of Motown with a sign. Say, what you see on this board is what's in this bill. <laughs> that was it for us, man. <laughs> Believe it or not, that was it for us, man. That, I believe it. That was the end of that road, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, man, Mike. Mike was a mess, man. He was a great cat. If you messed up, late to the gig, then do your stuff. He, when pay time came, he find you and buy yourself a sweater. That, that was independent. Me and Grant did that on our own. Grant had the track and he had another boy singing it. And the boy wasn't singing it. And so I told him, I said, man, I'll dub on the track. We take it to Cincinnati and get us some money. Because we were broke. I was broke. See, Sid, but he'd always told me, you bring, you, you carry everybody else records. Why you don't bring me a record? So we took him, keep on keeping on. And he gave us 7,000 a piece. I tossed a penny in a wishing well My wishes didn't come true I even wished upon a wishing star All the time I was wishing for you Put my faith in an old chicken ball Nothing seemed to turn me on And we all jumped ship well, we weren't, you know, getting no money. We, we weren't getting any releases. Because, you know, I told you what happened. That earlier incident, I was gigging, you know, but I needed a little more than that. I, and then they brought Mike in, and that was the demise of the company, actually. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. That was the demise of the company, because we were doing just fine. We were a good team, man. Uh, Rudy and Grant Burton and myself, the BRB. We rehearsed your opening number And you made your grand debut They applauded wow, like rolling thunder Girl, they fell in love with you Oh, as the crowd cried out You probably know of Tony Johnson Tony and Tyrone. Well, he took me there. We said, let's go write some stuff for Ted White, man. So, okay, so when I went, then Ted took me to Muscle Shows to, to, to record. The Stone Rock stuff. We only, I only did four tunes with them, and I asked them to relinquish his hold on my contract. In no uncertain terms, I asked him to. I saw where he, he had gotten a, an advance for uh, $10,000 for me from Capital. You didn't see much of it? 700, right. and then he brought up a list of everything that he had spent for the whole time I'd known him. Meals, everything. When he asked me to go, he taught me a lot. Taught Aretha a lot too. After that, it's been all, all do it yourself. This old heart of mine 